ask that you hold your questions until the end of that first break. And then we can have more questions when the presentation is over. After my father died, my brothers and I were cleaning out his basement and we, we found once again, the World War II diaries and souvenirs that my father had collected. We had found them once when we were kids, but then they just laid in the basement after that. And so for the past couple of years, I'd been taking the diaries and turning them into an electronic format. I've been trying to identify the events, research some of the pictures that he had in it. And this is a compilation of, of what I have found, just a quick story about his life and career in the army. My father was born in 1916 in Winthrop, Maine, the son of Canadian immigrants, but he was raised by his grandmother in Augusta 22 Northern Avenue in the mill blocks, the blocks that were operated and owned by the Edwards Manufacturing down in Augusta, where Mill Park is now. And the apartments were located where the Augusta Fuel Company is located. And my father grew up in a household full of aunts and uncles, cousins and children. And he learned to speak French and English as a child. After Pearl Harbor, he was drafted and he was inducted in Portland, Maine on April 20th, 1942. He did, he did his basic training down at Fort McClellan and he was assigned to the Army Corps of Engineers, the 591st Engineering Boat Regiment, Company H. And he went to specialized training at Camp Edwards, Massachusetts, located on Cape Cod. The 591st was responsible for landing troops on beaches during amphibious attacks. And this is my father in his, in his gear in the landing craft. He was being trained to be a pilot. And this is a picture of the type of exercises that he was going through. He would be one of the people in, in the boat and other folks from the boat would attack the beach. So he set sail for Europe in August of that year out of New York. And he said it was quite a sight to see with 10 troop, 10 troop ships, 2,000 bo uh, boys in each one. It was the largest convoy to date headed to England. And once he got there, he wrote to his sister, Rare Fontaine, I shall never forget the morning I left. The sun was just coming out from behind some hills. The whistle blew and <clears throat> excuse me, I hurriedly put some clothes on and went up to deck. I couldn't help but have a lump in my throat. My father was a bit of an emotional character. But once he got to England, his duties changed. After spending a little bit of time in Northern Ireland, he and his company were sent to Liverpool where they were turned into stevedores, people who emptied and filled ships with cargo. What happened was during the trip over to England, the Navy decided that they would be providing pilots. After all, they were boats and the Navy is supposed to be responsible for boats. So my father ended up being a hatch crew, emptying cargo from ships. Being a stevedore may not be as exciting as a pilot of a landing craft, but it's a lot safer. And it turns out that 60% of the military personnel in Europe did not see combat. They were doing other things, financial, medical, transportation, logistics, like my father was doing. And I don't mean to downplay the, the people who fought on the front lines. Because of their courage and the sacrifices, we defeated the Germans but it was essential that they get all the help they needed from the rear echelon. Napoleon said, an army runs on its belly. If it doesn't get the food or the equipment it needs, it's not going to go anywhere. And during the war, 
Eisenhower said, wars have been won or lost primarily because of logistics. And that's true. And even in this war, there were a number of times when things were touch and go simply because the supplies didn't quite get there in time. And logistics played a vital part of the role. There were over 5,000 merchant ships sailing both the Pacific and the Atlantic Ocean delivering war goods. 73 million tons of cargo were sent to Europe and North Africa during the war, but there weren't enough civilian workers to unload them all. And in this picture, you see, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> you see Liberty ships being built in South Portland, Maine. There were four shipyards there that built 240 ships. Excuse me. <clears throat> after, after, hold on a minute. <clears throat> I apologize for that. After working on the docks in Liverpool for a couple of months, his company was put, up, put aboard a, a troop transport. And the rumors were that they were going to someplace hot. And it was true. They were on one of the invasion fleets going to North Africa, French North Africa, on what was called Operation Torch. In 1940, the French government signed an armistice with Germany and Germany occupied the north and west of France, but left southern France and France's possessions in Africa unoccupied. And this would be the countries of Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia. And that was the first target of the war invasions that the allies decided to do. It was a marvel of coordination in my perspective, the Western Tank Task Force, which landed in Morocco, sailed all the way from the United States. The Center Task Force and the Eastern Task Force sailed out of England, but they all had to arrive at the same time in secret, sailing through submarine infested waters, and they did that perfectly. My father was on the center task force, which landed in Oran Harbor. This is Oran Harbor a year after the invasion, but this is, a, this is basically what he saw and what was there. The French put up a battle on the invasion. They were required by the armistice with Germany to defend against any invasion of French territory. And so they did fight for a few days. But by no November 11th, the fighting was over. Everybody was now friends once again, and they started unloading the cargo ships in the port of Oran. Although the timing of the invasion seemed to work perfectly, other parts of the planning weren't quite right. They had not supplied enough food and ammunition to get the landing troops more than just a couple of days without running out. And so when my father and his crew landed in Oran on the 13th, he basically found the people on shore running out of food, running out of ammunition and other supplies. And so they were very glad to see the hatch crews, the stevedores land with the cargo ships. This is the first time my father uses his French in Oran. And the first thing he does is he finds somebody, gets some wine, and brings it back to the ship for his buddies and himself. Now, life in the rear echelon, behind the front lines, the other side of the front lines, was not easy. 
They worked hard, they worked long hours, they worked double shifts, emptying the cargo ships. But there were still were some opportunities for socialization and sightseeing. North Africa, even though it was French, was still a strange land. My father being used to the climate and the atmosphere and social structure of New England, found the North African communities very, very foreign to him. But he did speak French, which was a big bonus. He was able to make a lot of friends. He bargains for souvenirs much better than his English friends could. Once in a while, he was called to translate at the docks, which was a good use of his talent. And it seems like every time he was at a new city, he would adopt a family. This is the Rene Perrault family, which is the one that he decided to adopt in Iran. The Christmas of that year wasn't very exciting. He was still unloading ships. He would unload British ships, American ships, Canadian ships, ships from all the different allied countries. One of the first contacts he made for socialization was the French National Guard. And you're seeing the second diary entry on this page. He went to an officer's house, met his wife, had eggs, heard the radio, pleasant evening. And after a while, he invited his buddies from the company and he would translate between the National Guard and his buddies and just pass a good evening every now and then. One of the officers in the National Guard told him about a family, the Payroli family, who had a daughter, an 18 year old daughter by the name of Louise who was studying English and maybe Al could help her out with her English. And sure enough, Al did. In fact, she became his first overseas girlfriend, Louise Payroll. And after a while, they would go out to dances, movies, and just walking the town together. When the Americans and the British landed in North Africa, the Germans almost immediately occupied southern France and sent troops into Tunisia to occupy Tunisia. And this is where the battle was going to be fought, right along this line here. And as the battlefront moved towards the east, my father also changed his ports from Iran to areas here, the town of Skidda and Phillipsville, getting closer and closer to Tunisia. Eventually, May 13th, 42, uh, 43, the German and Italian troops that had not escaped surrendered. And after that, my father and his crew were brought in to start using the port of Brazert. And Brazert was quite a port. It had an inland salt water lake with a lot of docking facilities. There was one called La Pecherie, there was one at the airport, Caruba, and one at a place called Ferryville, which is now called Menzel Burguiba. And all of these places were places where boats could, ships could pull in and be loaded and unloaded. This was from my father's collections of news clippings. It's a paper from Eastern Algeria. It says, Tunis and Desert are, are delivered victory. And the picture they have actually shows some of the destruction in the town of Desert from the fighting. It doesn't show very clear on, uh, over the screen, unfortunately. But this is just a foreshadowing of some of the things my father would be seeing later on in the war. So he lands in Bazurit in June, and again, he sees buildings demolished. Nothing's looking very good in that town, but still, he's got to work at emptying the cargoes. I want to point out a statement here. 
Everyone stole cards. We'll be seeing a little bit more of that just in a minute. But after a week of working in Bazurit, his company moved on to the town of Ferryville. And one of the first things that happens is he and his friends, Powers and O'Donnells, start looking around for families that could provide some services, laundry, food, entertainment. And they find the families of Mrs. Campus and a Mrs. Burrell. As a gift, they would bring the people cans of corn from their own supplies. And they had a good time. And immediately, my father took to the Campus family. And you can see in this picture that it's a large family with aunts and uncles and kids, very much like what my father had back in Augusta. And of course, they had a young lady, single, by the name of Georgette, which my father took a liking to. And that was his second World War II girlfriend. My father actually complained about being shy, but it seemed like he kept being able to make relationships with women fairly easily. So Christmas, Christmas in Ferryville in 43 was a good time. They went to church together. My father was very religious and he would attend mass Sunday mass at civilian churches whenever he could instead of doing it on base. Again, it reminded him of being on being home because that's what would, he would do at home, go to mass and nice churches with choir singing for the Vespers in the evening. But on this Christmas day, they went to church, took some pictures, had a nice time, sang, played, drank from a bottle, and he started to cry. Whether he cried because he missed his family back home or because this was so happy of a time, he doesn't say. It's probably a little bit of both. Now, back to the cots that were being stolen. It seemed like the people in his squad would redirect supplies for personal use. Stole stockings, stole underwear, some cigarettes, more underwear, more sea rations. And all of this stuff was for personal use, except for the cigarettes. My father did not smoke. And those cigarettes were probably used for bartering and for gifts. But nothing that happens in the army goes unnoticed. And eventually word got out that some items were missing. It wasn't quite match up on what was coming off the ships and what was on the clipboards for numbers. So in October, the officers decide to do an inspection, but nothing in the army remains a secret. One of my father's friends, Waters, came running down. There's gonna be a shakedown inspection. The shakedown inspection is where everything in the tents are brought outside for examination. So the people in his squad have all of these things that don't belong there, shirts and underwear and shoes. My father didn't have a whole lot. He just put his under his tent, but other people panicked and they just threw their surplus clothing and supplies into ditches and they got ruined. But by the time the officers got there, everything was put away. They didn't find a thing. The next day, my father's entry read, reads, he had breakfast, shaved, fixed the trap door to hide stolen rations. My father was a very practical person. But in spite of not finding anything on that day, the officers did eventually build up enough evidence to court-martial almost everybody in his squad. Fortunately, very few people were found guilty. My father and most of the other people were acquitted. There were two of his squad mates that were found guilty and sent to the stockade for a couple of weeks. But my father was off scot-free. 
But after that, the redirection pretty much stopped. Another problem my father had was with censorship. He used to write letters. Some of his letters were six, seven, eight pages long. And he would love to write about the places he had been and visited. This is a copy of a letter that he wrote to his sister, a rare Fontaine. And you can see here that part of it has been cut out. The censors did that because he was talking about the places he had been. And you could not do that in the letters that you mailed. You cannot talk about the troops, you cannot talk about the ships, you cannot talk about the places you were. After a while, the censors got tired of cutting things out in my father's letter, so they started returning them. So a letter to Louise came back, and another letter came back from the censors. And finally, November 15th, his captain said, okay, you got to stop this. For punishment, you got to write the censorship rules five times, like Bart Simpson being on the blackboard, I shall not. But that was not his only punishment. When he was in Liverpool, he had made corporal. And so at this point, his punishment was being taken down and reduced to the rank of buck private. That's life. But my father, I think at that point, learned his lesson as far as how to write or not write letters. But he was still writing letters. And in one letter, he actually writes, I'm so enthusiastic about this, my pen is on fire. And he still sent just regular letters on onion skin paper for airmail back home. <clears throat> but all sorts of paper letters going back and forth across the ocean would really, really add a lot to the cargoes that were going for the troops. And so in the beginning of the war, the military came up with what's called a V-mail system. And with this system, a person could write a letter on a one page form with an address on it. That form would be microfilmed. The microfilms would be sent by plane instead of ship to its destination. And at the destination, they would be developed into a four by five card. And basically this saved a lot of weight. Two pounds of microfilm was equivalent to a hundred pounds of letters. And this is an example of one of the V-mails that my father sent to his sister, Rare. Some of the companies would have artists draw up greeting, greeting cards. And this one from North Africa, from my father. This is a dime for comparison size. This stamp here, is a sensor stamp that's been approved by the sensors. So that's nice. My father was learning how to do it. But life in the rear echelon was not also always a day on the beach. My father went through quite a few air raids and most of them didn't amount to a whole lot. But on this one day on August 18th was a pretty drastic one. We really got scared. There were some large expo explosions nearby you saw a lot of planes, they didn't see any of them come down. And these are more examples of air raids that took place. The, the bottom one in Bezirat was after he went to a USO, USO show with Bob Hope and Francis Langford. And it happens that Bob Hope wrote about this air raid. He writes that he had to spend a long time in the ditches waiting for the all clear to, to come. And it was Francis Langford, the singer, that actually helped him get out of the ditch. Let's review the timeline just a little bit, just to get an idea of where we are. So war was declared in, de in December 8, 41, Pearl Harbor Day. My father was inducted April 20th, 42 that November was the landing in Iran in North Africa. The Soviets defeated the Axis army in Stalingrad. The Axis comprised Germany, Italy, and, and their allies. 
I add this just to try to emphasize a little bit that the Soviets played a huge role in the defeat of, the, of Germany. And a lot of books, a lot of movies simply don't even mention that. My father never met up with the Soviets, but I just wanted to add that just for historical purposes. The Axis surrendered in Tunisia in May. The father was in Bizert in June. The Allies invaded Italy on September 9th. And in the beginning of the new year, my father is off to Corsica. So all, to, all good things come to an end, especially in the army. Nothing seems to be permanent. So on June 4th, my father enters the boat. He cries like a baby. He and Georgia kiss, and they are mad about each other. And they set sail. This boat that he's on, the British boat that he's on, actually stays in the harbor a day or two, and finally sets sail. And they land in Ojasio, Corsica on January 10th. And he looks around, and it looks to be like England. And although he just cried about leaving his girlfriend, he can still see the girls in downtown. He still kept his eyes open. <clears throat> After a few weeks of emptying boats at the docks in Ajaccio, my father and his crew are put on trucks and they ride across the mountains of Corsica through some snow and eventually end up in the town of Bastia. This is Bastia, how it appears today. And I don't think it's that different from what my father saw. See a lot of, a lot of old buildings by the waterside, the churches, villages up in the hill and the mountains in the background. Of all the places my father was stationed, this was going to be his favorite. The mountains reminded him of home. There was snow and it's a Mediterranean island and surrounded by warm water and still you have snow up in the mountains. I thought that, that was remarkable. The clear streams coming from the mountains were filled with trout and my father loved to fish. And he quickly found somebody, a Mr. D'Angelo in Bastia, who taught him where the fishing spots were and provided him with fishing gear. When my father set sail from New York, he could not bring his camera with him. He was an amateur photographer. The army was worried about security, pictures floating, floating around that the spies could, could get. But, when, but as he was leaving, Zurich, he got a package from home with his camera and film. So at this point, we're starting to see his own shots. And this is Company H of the Engineering Boat Regiment. And you can spot my father in these pictures quite easily. He always has a large smile. And of course, he has to go wandering and adopt another family. And this time it was the Santini family. And they had quite a few adults, grandparents and some young children. These are the Santini girls, the daughters of the family. And he would spend nights there. They would do his laundry, have meals and just spend time in the evening playing some card games sometimes. But trout fishing wasn't the only thing he did. He also loved to swim and Corsica in Bastia did have some beaches. And he happened to meet a girl by the name of Jose at these beaches and became very friendly with her. She ended up being his third and probably his most serious girlfriend of the war. And you can see here that they walked the streets and he escorted her home, met the mother, the grandmother, and life was good. 
And here they are on the beach. There's my father with a smile again. This is Jose. And this is her friend, Claire. Jose and Claire were almost inseparable. And these other men may be some of his work crew that he worked with. And of course, there's always time for fun. This is the post picture that my father had taken. I think the only person with a real instrument in this is the person with the guitar, which is right there. And my dad again with a big smile. Corsica Mountains in the background, the beautiful mountains of Corsica. Mail call, my father's favorite time, along with the meals. He, he actually liked army food. But everybody would be excited about mail call and my father would get letters, send letters. He'd get magazines and newspapers that were maybe a month or two old and he still would read them all and pass them along to everybody else. And of course, wherever you have a lot of soldiers on the 4th of July, you're gonna have a parade. This is an African-American regiment on the streets of Basia having a parade. And I was wondering, gee, could I actually find this on Google Maps? And sure enough, there it is. I was able to locate the street and by looking for this door and balcony and these windows here, I was able to find out that it was 17 Boulevard Paoli in Bastia, Corsica. But again, all good things must come to an end in the army. And come in October of 44, my father was being transferred and leaving Corsica. And as they heard that they were leaving, they decided to go have one last good day on the town, take a few pictures. And eventually at the end of the evening, they kissed goodbye. And this is one of the pictures from that tour on the town. And there is my father smiling again, and Jose and Claire. And again, I, there's no indication of who these other people may be. All right, so 1944 is where we are now. In the beginning of the year, my father arrived in Corsica. In June, the Allies liberated Rome. Then they landed in Normandy. And in August, they landed in Southern France. The war is really going on and marching forward. October 16th, my father is going to be in Naples, Italy. And then in the near future, in December, Germany is going to launch what's known as the Battle of the Bulge. And in the end of December, another lesser known German operation known as Operation Nordwind will take place. And both of these will have an effect on my father. Okay. At this point, I'd like to take a break. So I'm going to stop my sharing There we go. And I am going to rest my throat a little bit and be back in maybe five minutes. And after that, we'll take some questions if anybody has them. And you can unmute at this point and talk amongst yourselves if you'd like. Louis mentioned the shipyard in uh, South Portland that built the Liberty ships. And it's pretty impressive to go down there and think that at the start of the war, it was just mud flats. But within a very short time, matter of few months, they had built that whole shipyard and then really started cranking out all those Liberty ships. It's, it's amazing to see the display they have down there, of the big pictures with all of the people at the end of the ship, uh, shift rather, coming out of that shipyard 
and getting on what must have been three or four dozen buses waiting for that shift to get out. There were thousands of people working there. It was quite an quite a ensemble of, of things going on in South Portland and probably all over the rest of the country. Oh, uh, Mick. Yes, Chuck. Uh, I, I want to apologize for missing the meeting yesterday. I had a matter of appointments with the VA that I had to clear up and I was, by the time I finished that, I was too late to get in the meeting. No so problem. I'm very sorry about that. No problem. Uh, I, I just wanted to, to mention to the group that uh, those uh, all of those pictures are very reminiscent of my time in uh, Korea and Japan during the uh, Korean conflict with all the like the uh, all, all the soldiers lined up at uh, at mail call and and people standing around uh, and, and, and in, uh, exchanging sea rations with the uh, natives and and all of those things were were part of of uh, military life when when uh, fighting had died down. So uh, the, it, it, it's very reminiscent to me, very uh, nostalgic in a certain peculiar way. <laughs> so it, it, it's really it's really fun to see. I had a. My, my buddy and I, we volunteered uh, for the service together. And uh, because he had a bad back, he was, a, uh, he was uh, not listed for combat. So he, set, he spent his wartime years in Switzerland skiing. <laughs> I was always envious of him because a lot of the time I was spending my time Foxholes. So, uh, but but that's that's the luck of the army, you know, and and the people who got the uh, rear, uh, uh, you know, behind the uh, the front echelons were 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 really really quite lucky, and and some of them could have a pretty good uh, pretty good social life as as the. Uh, as Louis dad demonstrates. I still have uh, some of that uh, V-mail uh, that oh, really? I had uncle. Uh, it's the onion skin, one piece type uh, envelope and, and, and uh, writing surface all in one and, and uh, all folded up. But you uh, unfold them, and uh, many of them look a lot like Swiss cheese uh, for the uh, results of the uh, sensors who, who went through them. Uh, but uh, they're very interesting to read. Actually, uh, I have them from two uncles, one that was in the European theater, and the other one, <laughs> we all have an uncle that is no relation. And uh, we had one, and he was uh, stationed as a uh, CB uh, in uh, Panama. And I guess there are, uh, he alludes to building uh, concrete wharves. Now, I've never been to Panama, so I have no idea. Uh, but uh, I guess that's what he did during the war, uh, was build these concrete uh, uh, piers in uh, in Panama. Okay, Louis, you want to start back up again? We should have everybody uh, mute themselves if they've unmuted. So Hold on. Uh, first, uh, does anybody have any questions about my father's experience so far? We can, we can take a few questions now. Joan, I see a hand coming up from Joan. Yes. I have a question about uh, when you showed the inland lake that the ships could go into in some country, I forget which, but I couldn't see how, where the ships could actually get into the inland lake. Oh, there's a, there's a small canal 
uh, right near the Mediterranean coast. I think it was where the word Bezurit was. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. okay. Uh, Margie. Um, was it typical uh, during the war for families um, in the, the cities or towns where the Americans were to kind of uh, adopt a, a boy like that and spend a lot of time and socializing? Is that something that was done routinely both by the American and the uh, Europeans or North Africans, wherever they were? Is that typical? I, I, I'm not sure. I think my father was a special case just because he spoke French and because of his personalities. But in his diary, he does write about other servicemen being at those houses and other houses as well. But I'm not sure if it was quite the same relationship as my father had with them. Hmm. Thanks. Okay. How about one more question? Yeah, uh, Louis. Uh, Louis. Yes. Who's speaking? Is that Chuck? Okay. You're muted, Chuck. Chuck, you muted. Sorry. Okay. Uh, uh, what was the uh, reaction of the of the, the soldiers that time to the uh, invasion of Normandy, where we <laughs> suffered great losses, and in the Battle of the Bulls, which was one of the worst battles of uh, of the war, yeah, were they? cognizant of that and, and express concern? Did they know know about what was going on there? Well, they knew, they knew that it was going on. Uh, there always was rumors of different invasions going on in France. And so every now and then my father would mention something in his diary, but it never actually happened. It was just a rumor. But when Normandy happened, they did know about that. But I don't know if they knew the extent, extent of the fighting, because he did not mention anything about the fighting and how long it took. Okay, we will go on and I will start sharing my screen again. Okay, we left off with the little, little calendar here. And my, now my father is going to head off to Naples. He was in Oran, then he went to Bezurit. Bastia is located on the east coast of Corsica. And now he's going to the town, rather the big city of Naples. And big city it was. It was the biggest city my father had ever been in. And he was a little bit intimidated. So he didn't go very far. He pretty much spent most of his time in his, in his barracks. But at this point in time, the 591st Engineering Boat Regiment was disbanded. And they were turned into an engineer combat regiment. And the purpose of being in Naples was to learn, get arms training, relearn how to shoot rifles, other types of guns. My father seemed to have an affinity for the bazooka. And here he is with his bazooka and his teammate, David, who would put the, the, the shell in the back for my father to launch. But the main purpose of being in Naples was to learn how to build bridges. A little side note before we talk about that. I want to point out health inspection nude, nude at one o'clock. Seems like every other week there was a health inspection. The troops had to be kept healthy. And one of the biggest things that they were looking for was venereal disease. And up to this point, it seemed like most of my father's regiment seemed to be doing pretty well. But back to bridge building. 
they would build bridges, take them apart, build them back up several times, all to become perfect as far as being able to build them quickly and correctly. And the type of bridges that they were mostly building was called a Bailey Bridge. A Bailey Bridge was invented by Don Bailey, an Englishman at the beginning of the war. And it was a modular truss bridge that could be built without any heavy equipment. And in this case, you see the trusses being carried by a number of soldiers. And they could do this completely by hand, both assembly and transportation of all the material. Of course, it helped if they could get heavy equipment, but if they could not, they could still put them together. But they still had some time for leisure activities. And my father was able to go visit Pompeii and an aquarium in Naples. And other times he would simply sit at the Red Cross or the YMCA writing letters. He could not speak Italian. He could not adopt families in Italy. And it seems, seems like the atmosphere in Italy was very different from what he had experienced so far in North Africa and Corsica. But the war, war goes on and the training is done. And towards the middle of December, they end up in Southern France, just north of Marseille, waiting to be shipped up to the north. And this is when the Battle of the Bulge is just starting. And there's probably some confusion and some change in plans when it comes to where to send these folks that just came from Naples. But eventually they end up going north towards the Lorraine Alsace area to the town of Baccarat. They get onto a convoy of trucks and trailers and they speed up the road. They stop in the towns of Lyon and Dijon for rest. They spend the night in the trailers, in the trucks, on cots on the ground, covered by awnings. And it was quite a ride up. And it was quite cold and it's sometimes even snowing. So this is where they took off from, Saint Martin de Croix. And they ended up in a couple of days riding up in Baccarat. Other towns that will be mentioned in his diary will be Saint, Saint Avod and Rimoli. And his is his squad as they're traveling up to the north in the snow. And I can't be completely certain, but I think this is my father because just because of his smile. And this is some of the destruction that he encountered on his way up north in some of the towns. And here you see civilians trying to salvage whatever they could from the buildings. Battle of the Bulge started on December 16th. And that took place up here in Belgium. My father is located in the town of Baccarat in January. So in the Battle of the Bulge, the Germans pushed into Belgium and really set the Allies back quite a ways. And the front line moved from the blue to where the red area is showing. And that's the furthest that they got on December the 25th. The other advance of the Germans was an operation called Operation Nordwind. This is sometimes called the other Battle of the Bulge. And that took place in the Alsace region, right in this area here, right where my father was. And this is the front line on January 1st when the attack started. And by, by January 25th, the Germans had advanced quite a bit. And my father was one days away, 20 miles away from the front lines at that time. So when he got up to Baccarat in France on the 13th, he was hearing a lot about the war, bombers going overhead. 
he could see flashes up from the house when he looked towards the east. And he was hearing all sorts of rumors about how the Germans were pushing forward. And again, on the 14th, more rumors about things going bad. And he decided to gather ammunition for his bazooka. On the 19th, they were working on gun emplacements, getting ready to meet the charge that may be coming any day. But fortunately, the 7th Army that my father was connected to was able to stop the advance and started pushing back on the Germans. And things calmed down a little bit towards the end of January. And in the end of January, he went up to the town of St. Avald, where he would be stationed for a while, working on roads, some bridges. And at this point, they were staying in barracks that used to be German barracks. They would also stay overnight in cement factories and schoolhouses. And one time, they even spent a few days in a castle, the Chateau Sorbet in Sorbet, France, which was nothing special, evidently, because my father didn't write a whole lot about it. Things were relaxed enough come February, so the company got a day off and they decided to go take a tour of Nancy, Nancy, France, which is one of the larger cities in that area. And here he is in front of the statue of Amphitrite in Stanislaus Place in Nancy. I have no idea who the two children are, just a couple of cute girls that my father wanted to have in this picture. This is what the fountain looks like nowadays. It's really beautiful. It's on the UNESCO World Heritage Site. Towards the end of February, his company moved to the town of Remily, and he was there for a few days. And this little boy by the name of Roland took a liking to him, started sitting down with him during meals. And my father took a liking to him as well and started associating with him. He would build him a swing set, find a broken bicycle and fix it up for him, go to his house in the evening, have a meal, meet his grandmother and his mother. And just basically just uh, another substitute for the family that he missed from back home. And this is Roland here and his sister Nicole. This is a Bailey Bridge, a completed Bailey Bridge. This is a truss on top as a railing. And there are other trusses underneath supporting the planks, the decking planks. My father is about to go into Germany at this point in time. And these are some of the towns that we'll be talking about. Frenschelbach, Zeibrücken, Machtweidenfeld, and Ensingen and Kreilsheim. And these are where the front lines are at different points in time. This is March 24th, April 4th, April 24th here. So come March 24th, it's time to leave Remily. And again, it's a tearful goodbye, this time with Roland. By the time my father gets into Germany, the Breschenbalk at the border, he's starting to see a lot more destruction, the village completely destroyed. And by the time he gets to Zweibrachen, just a little ways off to work on a bridge, again, completely destroyed. Zweibrücken was right along the Siegfried line, which was the major defense line protecting Germany. And the Canadian Air Force pretty much destroyed it by bombing about two weeks before my father got there. And there was be a lot of destruction in Germany caused by bombing. One out of every five structures in Germany would be rendered uninhabitable. And in some of the major cities and towns, 50% of the areas 
residential areas would be destroyed. And this is just one example of what my father saw. I'm not sure what town this is in, but it's pretty devastating. But the main purpose of his company was to build bridges. And this is what they're doing here. In this case, building a wooden bridge and finishing up the deck of the wooden bridge. And of course, while, while you're working, you gotta eat hearty. And here's his squad at a impromptu table made out of planks chowing down. And in the evening, there was really no place to go. You can't go out and fraternize with the enemy, with the population there. So a lot, of, a lot of time was spent simply inside writing and reading. On April 20th, my father and his crew had a major project to work on, the Machtindenfeld Bridge. This bridge had been blown up a week before by the Germans trying to prevent the advance of the Allies into Germany, further into Germany. And my father and other people were tasked with rebuilding it and they were working 24 seven on this bridge. They were working at night underneath the lights, which attracted a German airplane. And every night, for a while, a German airplane would come and strafe the bridge. All the workers had to hide under the bridge or go up and hide in the woods on the bank. And fortunately, nobody in my father's squad got hurt, but there were some casualties in all of this. The soldiers called this pilot Bedcheck Herman because he came at nighttime just when everybody should have been in bed. And this is what the bridge looks like now. It's, you, you can hardly tell that it had been through that kind of destruction in the war. It looks like it never happened. And I think a lot of places in Europe have been rebuilt to their uh, authentic condition. But Germany soon surrendered. May 8th was VE Day. My father and his crew did not celebrate a whole lot. They were still busy building roads and bridges, but eventually things got a little bit more relaxed and they were ended up working just one shift instead of two shifts. And my father being a fisherman would go fishing as much as he could, which was almost every other day. And here you can see the fish that he and his company got in the German streams. But when the war is over, you got to do something with all the people over there. There were 3 million service men and women in Germany that needed to be brought home. Planning for demobilization actually started before the Normandy landing. They started figuring out where the staging areas were going to be how to rank people, who would be coming home first, and how many boats and airplanes would be required. And so there were some staging areas up in, along the English Channel, and there were some along the Mediterranean near Marseille. And that is one that my father was going to. However, by the time my father and his squad got there, they found out that there was nothing but a bunch of rocks in a field. He was responsible to build the actual barracks and all the other facilities. But they did have German prisoners of war to help them. So some people would be doing the actual construction. Some people would be actually supervising the POWs that were also doing some construction work. But the army had to keep all of its 3 million service people occupied. 
And some of it was doing actual real construction work. Some of it was doing less real construction work. The Army designated the Riviera Recreational Area in the towns of Cannes and the towns of Nice. Cannes was for the officers. Nice was for the enlisted men. And when you went to Nice for a work detail, it was kind of cushy. You worked one day and then you had two days off and you were given leave to go explore the town, walk along the beaches, go to the Red Cross, the casinos, and just pretty much enjoy yourself and doing just a little bit of work. But that didn't last very long though. It was like being on leave for, for a week or two. So after, after his time was up in Nice, my father went back to working, fixing roads up in the area of the staging areas. And of course, to keep them occupied, they also had these huge amphitheaters. This one was McNair's Theater. And you can see all of these people here. That's not bushes, that is soldiers. And they would see movies there and they would see Bob Hope other USO shows. My father was not due to leave until later in the summer or into the fall, but word came over a telegram that his grandmother was sick. She had had a stroke, a cerebral hemorrhage, and her right side had been paralyzed as a result. So my father started by going to the offices, seeing if he could get uh, a, a leave sooner to go home. He started working with the Red Cross. And of course, Army always has red tape and it always takes a while, but they did actually send him home sooner than he was supposed to. He was put onto a B-17 bomber and sent out of Arles, France. And this is the route that he took. From Arles, he flew to Morocco spent the night in Morocco, then to the Azores, spent the night there, then to Gander, Newfoundland, and finally to Moncton. And this is what he writes when he gets to Moncton. Certainly feels good, the smell of clover in the grass, the familiar scenery of rolling hills in the background. I was surprised upon seeing a robin searching for worms. Hard to realize that citizens in camp are speaking English just like us. Shortly after landing in Moncton, he arrives in Fort Devens, Massachusetts, where he's discharged on the 28th of July. And he makes his way back home pretty quickly in time to still find his grandmother alive. Unfortunately, she didn't survive very much longer. She died in September. But after that, my father pretty much was like all the other returning veterans from World War II. He didn't talk very much about his experience. Every now and then, my brothers, we get a story about firing a bazooka or building a bridge. But sometimes the bridges didn't exactly meet on the other side where the road was but he really didn't talk very much about any of that. He pretty much remained silent. And I think that's how a lot of the vets treat the war and their experiences. Well, that's pretty much what I have. And if you do want more information about World War II, I would recommend the Liberation Trilogy, a set of three books written by Rick Atkinson. And these are very good about the World War II in Western Europe, but they concentrate on the front lines. If you want to learn more about other aspects of the war, the rear echelon, what was going on with logistics, the medical corps, I suggest going to the US Army Center for Military History, and there's the web, uh, web address for that. And if you have any questions, uh, that you want to talk to me later on, my email, louisfontaine138 at gmail.com. Okay. 
now I will open it up to questions. I would just like to say, Mr. Fontaine, this is absolutely priceless. And uh, I congratulate you for putting this together, for keeping this family history. Uh, this will live for you uh, forever. This is uh, uh, an absolute uh, priceless documentary. And uh, we thank you for that. Well, thank you very much for the praise. I'm not done yet. There's still a lot of work to put all this together permanently. Um, Louis? Hi, Priscilla. Hi. Um, I, I concur with what Bob just said. I mean, this is just like, um, gives us another view of what the war was like. Uh, because uh, when in the beginning, when you talked about Africa, I said, it, in none of what you talked about, had your father seen any fighting or any how, how, how he was affected by that part of the war? Did he ever write about that? Because a lot of times people say that men that came back never wanted to talk about that piece of it. Did he ever talk to you, uh, Louis, about that? He, did, he didn't talk about it, and he only mentioned something about it a couple of times in his diary. There was one time when he was in Corsica where oh. the, uh, the, uh, the Free French Army boarded some ships to go and do an invasion on the island of Elba along yeah. the coast of Italy. Yeah. And, and the amount of resistance there was really underestimated and there was a lot of wounded coming back and my father saw them and then you know okay. that really did affect him okay all right wow hmm. I, I, and uh, I, the fact that he spoke french i think made his experience a lot different than some of the other men that were in his group uh because he did reach out to and made it real for him the, the mm -hmm. people real thank you Okay, Eugene, Gene. You need to unmute yourself, Gene. Eugene, you need to unmute. Where your father was stationed, isn't that the area where we had all the uh, huge tank battles from John Patton? Uh, he wasn't, he was. And, oh, in Africa and in Tunisia, there were some very large tank battles, yes, there. And I'm not sure if Patton was, how Patton was involved in that or not. There were other generals in North Africa besides Patton. Because the reason I brought this up was the, the reason that the Germans lost was because they had advanced beyond their supply line. And they right. had tanks running out of fuel and they had to literally leave them there to escape. And by the same token, the, the Americans were aware of this and they made sure they had sufficient fuel for the tanks as they proceeded north up there. Mm -hmm. So he may have been involved in all of this mess. No, he, he wasn't involved in, in, in all of that. He was still away from the fighting when he was in Tunisia. But something very similar happened to the US troops in Normandy as they were breaking out and chasing the Germans. When Penn got to the town of Metz, the supply line was so long that they could not keep with all of, keep up with all of the uh, soldiers and tanks. So they actually had to stall their advance because of a, a lack of supplies. Okay. Well done, by the way. Thank you, thank you. Uh, and Andrea has a question. Uh, well, no, just to, I wanted to share a couple of comments. First, thank you for the information you shared. I'm glad your father enjoyed um, army food because my father, who was a year older than your father, um, was a staff sergeant and he was in charge, he was a cook and he um, was in Algeria, 
And after Algeria found his way to Italy, he was there at Anzio. And of course, there wasn't any cooking going on. He was passing out rations mm -hmm. and supplying artillery shells to the, the front line. Um, but because he was second, a first generation Italian, his father was from Italy, he spoke it Italian. And he still had relatives in Italy. So his experience in Italy was very positive and he had an opportunity. He had to get um, permission from uh, the, you know, his commanders, but he had the opportunity to visit some of his relatives and make contact and talk with, with them. So there, Priscilla, knowing a different language is really <laughs> important, isn't it? <laughs> so um, anyway, just wanted to share that. Thank you. Louis, I guess. Oh, 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 wait, wait. Oh, I want to get to, uh, let's go to Cecile first. You had her hand up for a while. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Now you can talk. Well, I guess your dad did a great job. I'm very proud. And uh, he was also a very handsome man from what I can see and picked up a lot of nice girlfriends. <laughs> and and I, um, I, I met a war bride that came back to Maine with a Maine man from France. Yeah, she, her name was Julianne. And she came from Paris, came home to Fairfield with a Mr. Puglia as a war bride. Hmm. There, uh, were, there were 50,000 war brides that had, 50? To be, oh, wow. 50, that had to be brought back with demobilization. Wow, I didn't know how many. Wow, well, I met one of them, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I did, and she was a lovely lady. I loved her. She was a lovely lady, and okay. of course, she spoke very nice French. And, okay, yeah, Michael so. Levy has a question. Uh, a, a couple of questions, if I may. I'm kind of curious about the diary of your father. Um, was it a number of journals? Uh, what and and how how big was this collection and how did he get it back home? Did he have to carry it around with him through the whole war? Uh, I'm sort of curious about how someone who does a diary manages to do it and then bring it home. Okay, uh, I want to go back to sharing my slides because the very last one was a picture of his diaries. Mm. Hold on. I can get to move right there. Oh, wow. If I see them, they're yeah. not very big at all. And basically, yeah. he wrote in uh, cursive, very nice handwriting, fortunately. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. some of them was fairly small. But yeah, I think he carried these with him throughout the war. They were not very big at all. And are these, uh, I'm seeing actually five of these little journals. Is that the entire diary that he that he left? Yes, yes, it is. Okay, all right. Well, there was one more that I haven't included, which was about his trip back home on the B-17, but that was just a little pamphlet. Mm -hmm. But these are the journals. Um, the, the other question is, it seems is that you're pretty knowledgeable about the war, and I'm curious, were you kind of a, a historian for your own personal purposes uh, before you became involved with these diaries or did these diaries inspire you to become uh, as learned as you are? I, I was always interested in history, but once I started getting involved in these diaries, I really, really started digging deeper, uh, reading the Atkinson books. There are other books on the on the Operation Norwind. There's a whole mess of documents online from the uh, uh, military history of the Army that you can download about logistics and uh, 
cargo ships and merchant marines. There's a lot of stuff out there. And if anybody's interested, there, there's there are things out there. My last comment is that it seems um, just the art or the act of keeping a diary can be unbelievably meaningful. And it seems to me that the, the fact that your father felt the desire and the need or the interest in keeping a journal has created something that's uh, uh, really, uh, you can't really measure it in money. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's really something that's fantastic. And it has a big ripple effect. I think that, uh, at least for me, I, I think this was utterly fantastic. Uh, and it just tells me uh, maybe what people who like to keep diaries end up doing for other people, even though they may not, that may not be their intention. That is the result of doing something like this. Yes. Thank you. I, I hope to publish this in one form or another, even if it's just a few copies for the family. Mm -hmm. okay. Pam, Pam had a question? Me? Yes, did you? <laughs> yes, I was just, I kind of lost track of all the dates. How long was your father overseas all at once? And did he ever have any leave? You mentioned a day or two at a time. Did he ever have a week or, uh, and I presume he never got to leave the area where the ships were. No, he never, he never had a long leave once he went across to Europe. Uh, he would have a day or two at a time. Mm -hmm. And they actually had lotteries within his company for people to go away on long leaves to places like Paris. My father keeps talking about so-and-so won the lottery to go to Paris, but he didn't. Mm -hmm. So was he there for three years, more than three years at a time? Yes, he was there from uh, the fall of 42, and he came back uh, uh, the, the summer of 45. Long time. Cheryl has a question. My, it's not a question. I, Hi. You may want to mention the amount of time that it took you to just get through these diaries and the amount of time it took you. I mean, this is not something you've been working on for a few weeks. You've been working mm -hmm. on multiple years putting this together. You might want to address that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's been it's been three years going through uh, the diaries and reading them and then typing them out mm -hmm. uh, in a mm -hmm. Word document. Mm -hmm. And once I had them all typed out, I was able to actually go read and then get a much clearer understanding of what he was going through. Mm -hmm. was hey, one one step. Okay. Carol? Hi, thank you for an extremely interesting presentation. It brought back a lot of memories from stories that my father and father-in-law told also. But I'm wondering if your father ever went back to any of the places where he was stationed when he was in the service. No, unfortunately not. No, no. Although I would like to go to Corsica. <laughs> it seems like that's a really nice place. Did he ever stay in touch with any of those girlfriends? Unfortunately, well, maybe fortunately, no. Otherwise, they may not be here. All <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, Priscilla, you had a question? Yeah. Were, were the um, journals written in French or in English? They're in English. They're all in okay. English. All right, okay. That one picture that he had standing in front of an arch with Mount Vesuvius through the arch was a, was a, a great photograph, I think. Yeah, he, he, was, he really was an amateur photograph, photographer and he would really try to get good poses. The one that you saw uh, where he was in Nice in front of the casino by a palm tree, he took the very same photo, but at nighttime, and you can see his silhouette in the very same position. So it's very interesting that sometimes the photos that he took. 
Bob and Kathy. Thank, thank you from us as well for a wonderful presentation. And it, regarding those photographs, what condition did you find them? And uh, was it your impression that very many of his peers also had cameras? I, I don't think a lot of people had cameras. And as far as the photographs, there are some in good condition. He actually has an album of photographs that he, that he has, that he put together when he came back from the war. But he also had envelopes of negatives that my brother, who's a lithography instructor, had his students develop into positives. And so a lot of them came from the, the, the positives. And then with some of these, I spent a lot of time on Google, Googling different places in France to find out exactly what they were and where they were. Like the statue in, in Nancy, the Amphitrite statue. It took a while for me to figure out where and what that was. Okay, no more questions? Well, thank you for your attention. I hope it was at least entertaining, if uh, not educational. And I look forward to hearing other people's presentations for the next few weeks. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you, Louie. Great job. Thank you.